Um, we're excited to be working with Rivers of Steel tonight on another fabulous program. Uh, this past summer, our students in our six week um, summer printmaking intensive called Rust, Radical Urban Soapscreen Team, um, had a chance to work with a few Rivers of Steel artists, Shane and Max, and they're still talking about the program six months later, so you know you're doing something right. Um, so we're excited to kick off tonight. Um, without any further ado, I'd like to start um, introducing our panel members this evening. Uh, Carlos Mayer Mi Rodriguez, also known as Mayor 139, grew up between Upper Manhattan and war-torn South Bronx. He was part of the group who revolutionized subway graffiti uh, during its peak in 1970s and the 80s. Combining his passion with contemporary art and academic analysis with graffiti-style writing, he pioneered a novel genre in 1984 around graffiti and modern sculpture with a focus on bridging early 20th century modernism and today's practices with technological tools. He was instrumental in the development of digital graffiti and design during the earliest days of computer adoption and garnered the famed Webby Award for his work. Notably in the 80s, he met Andy Warhol himself on many occasions and Warhol offered him advice as a young emerging artist and also featured him in the famed Interview Magazine, which you can see on the second floor in our social network um, show. Next up is artist Michael Wash. Uh, well, sorry, let me try, let me start. Oh, okay. <laughs> artist Michael Walsh, homegrown here in Pittsburgh, PA in 1974. I heard that was a good year. Absolutely. Um, and his career as an artist and sculptor evolved throughout the 1980s and 90s during the collapse of the American steel industry. His work is both informed by the history of metal sculpture processes, and he was a pioneer of the graffiti sculpture movement. Um, he also worked diligently over the past two decades to develop his work and to forward the trajectory of the movement. By engaging in both tactile and digital mediums, his goal is to make the art of our time. It's very Warholian. And last but not least, our moderator of the evening, Chris McGinnis. Um, as many of you know, he's an arts leader and visual artist living in Pittsburgh, founding director of the Rivers of Steel Arts, and he leads a dedicated team of creatives working to reshape Pittsburgh's urban industrial legacy through art and creative placemaking. In both his personal and professional work, Chris is similarly inspired by America's industrial story and notions of progress, understood through the lens of technology, social economics, and cultural identity. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Chris up to kick us off. Thank you, Nicole. Welcome, everybody. How are we all doing? Good. Well, uh, we're happy to be here, happy to have everybody here. Um, this has been a long time coming. We're really excited for tonight and uh, to be able to discuss with Walsh and Mayer you know, about their work and their experience in the residency. Um, we have a little bit of housekeeping to do before we get started, and we're going to have a preview of a film. Um, it's not the final cut, but it's, you're going to get kind of a sneak glimpse of a video that we're producing about the program after a short intro. But um, first, some thank yous. Uh, Definitely want to thank the Warhol for having us here tonight. We're really excited to be here. This was kind of the, the place that we had in mind, uh, ideally, to be able to give this talk and, and uh, conversation for the program. Definitely want to thank the National Endowment for the Arts. They provided the seed money that enabled us to launch the program to begin with, uh, followed by the Heinz Endowments, who were able to come on and uh, provide funding that supported the community learning series that Nicole alluded to earlier and the Kent Rockwell Foundation, as well as Chopping Down Films, who uh, put a lot of work into the video that we're going to see and have uh, you know, really done some outstanding work there. Um, in addition to that, I wanted to say a special thanks to some folks that have helped develop the vision for this program from the start and really helped see it through, in addition to uh, Carlos and Michael. Um, Ed Parrish was really instrumental in kind of coming up with the whole vision initially the, the idea that this should be something that we might want to look into as an organization and focus on as a program so thank you Ed. Paige Henry was did I mean what Paige always does 
incredible amount of work helping to realize the sculptures um, after they were cast and during the, the mold making process. Shane Pilster, uh, who is not here with us today, unfortunately, but um, Shane runs our graffiti art program and led the community learning series piece of the program, working with organizations throughout the area. Um, children's programming and youth programming and community programs uh, around the project and partners with Max Gonzalez, who I'm not sure if Max is here or not, but if you are, raise your hand. Um, maybe not. Um, anyhow, so about Industrial Grit and Graffiti, I want to give a little bit of context before we watch the uh, video so you have some sense of where we're at. In the decades following the collapse of Big Steel, the Cary Blast Furnace's National Historic Landmark became a laboratory for experimentation, a place where graffiti writers crossed paths with urban explorers, scrappers, sculptors, and others who recognized the latent creative potential in these abandoned mills. Through a variety of arts initiatives, Rivers of Steel celebrates the post-industrial era and its influence on a generation of artists and local leaders who continue the difficult work of channeling that energy into creative solutions for the community. We launched the Industrial Grit and Graffiti program in June of this year, 2022, to explore the unique convergence of graffiti and metal arts at the Cary Furnaces. We were honored to host Carlos Mayer and Michael Walsh as lead visiting artists for the week-long residency, and they were joined by local artists Connor Clark, Joshua Kroniak, and Jamie Matthews, of at least a couple of which I think are here tonight. Um, so thank you guys for your involvement in the program. During the residency, all the artists developed unique designs, generated molds for each of the objects that they created using traditional foundry processes of resin bonded sand. On the final day of the workshop, these molds were cast in iron in a large iron pour collectively as a group and prepped for display on site. The final artworks created during the residency are now on display throughout the Cary Blast Furnaces and will be able to be visited during our tour season next year between April and November. Industrial Grit and Graffiti is closely connected to the story of Monongahela Valley communities who, that are adjacent to the furnaces and their character has been shaped by industrial and post-industrial heritage. Coinciding with the residency, Rosa Steel launched a community learning series with various partners, including the Warhol, that included uh, free public events, skills building workshops, collaborative murals, educational tours and more for local youth and adults living in these communities surrounding the furnaces. The vision for Industrial Grit and Graffiti has grown into an annual program with Rivers of Steel and is dedicated to supporting artists who work in these mediums and encouraging greater community engagement around the subject. As the program evolves in future years, it's our hope that the passion and dedication that everybody brought to this in its inaugural effort will endure to the future. So I think with that, we are going to watch video and then we'll get the conversation started. <clears throat> Literally the backbone of a thousand industries, a long line of furnaces holds steel in the making. Steel that will someday enter your life, perhaps carry you safely on some journey, provide you with shelter, create an endless variety of comfort and convenience. Just the proper percentages of carbon and other elements are retained so that it will possess the exact characteristics needed. This is not something easy to find. You have to go to a college that does this normally to find this way of working. I want to make this available in the way of encouraging other graffiti artists to work in the industrial arts and work with their hands in three dimension and also work in the ever emerging and expanding digital realm. What's really nice about the organization is that it's preserving this whole industrial space for artists to come look at it, be inspired by it, and then go make art. The iron that came out of these furnaces literally built America's 20th century. So it's Panama Canal gates, it's the Empire State Building, Sears Tower, on and on and on. Seemingly overnight to the people in this region, 
all that work disappears. And so these places that were, you know, the site of employment for 150,000 people are transformed. The work goes away and then people start looking at these sites very differently. When it was vacant, this was our art gallery. It was amazing. It was just for us. But during the days, we would come and paint, and at night, we'd be in train yards, or we'd be on the East Busway, or we had mad cutty spots to paint because of all the hills here. You know, the, the first thought, and this is a natural thought for people, is that, oh, they're coming in because they want to destroy something. But the realization was, is that's not why people are coming in here. They weren't coming in here because they wanted to destroy it. They were coming in here because they loved it. And they were creating something new and beautiful here. They're not diametrically opposed. They're actually symbiotic. And, and, and it really does work together. Within the art program, we think about this post-industrial period as really being that key period where the arts plays an integral role in helping contribute to the interpretation. Graffiti is a huge piece of that. The interest of sculpture was already built into painting in the 70s when writers were alluding to three dimensions in their letters and pursued sculpting as a way of elevating graffiti and style writing. I personally just saw that graffiti wanted to jump off of the wall and we were already painting it, trying to make it as three-dimensional as possible. So it was there, but it wasn't realized in physical form until 1984 when Phase 2 did his letter A sculpture. That was the same year I did my first sculpture, and I believe Ramelzi was also beginning to do his letter racers. I started in 1997. I, I really had phase two and his work to look at, and, you know, Delta, Zeds in Amsterdam. We saw something in modernism and futurism and constructivism and applied graffiti to it. I was cutting the sculptures that I saw Bronx rooftop by hand with metal that I stole from the mass transit system. The reaction in the gallery when I did the first piece is so overwhelming that then I started chasing it and have never stopped. I was picking up behaviors or rhythms that I was finding through the break dancers, how things would pop, weave into each other. So that was built into wild style. From there, I started thinking about sculpture in a whole different way rather than sticking to the letter form, that it could actually be a free form, a freestyle. It's arduous from the beginning when you start making your mold and you start shaping it, getting it ready um, for this process that is slightly imperfect because you're dealing with all kinds of elements of sand and oil and air and fire. For me, it certainly is a great way of appreciating the challenges and the difficulty of working in a space like this whenever it was an industrial mold. You get the danger, you get the heat, you get the, you know, the, the sweat and the hard work. A couple of things that happened that were really unique in this residency. Finally realizing new work is one, but also having this reunion of sorts with Michael and some other people that helped me in 2016. They saw the sculptures that I made last time that were smaller people abstract sculptures and helped me with that. And so now they're seeing them like four feet tall and encouraging me and helping me realize something that weighs perhaps 800 pounds. I've been making this wall sculpture in small scale using 3D printers and I thought it would be really interesting to do it in a variety of scales and cast it in iron. I utilized a lot of different mold making techniques and CNC technology. The, the other work that I made was very reminiscent of a letter or letters. Uh, each person keeps seeing a different letter in it, which was very true to the graffiti work that I paint. The arts thrive in this place that has this weighted history, but it brings us all together to work as a community towards one goal, which is that core. 
I was somehow in these abandoned sites, almost taken over by this industry and the ghost of it and its spirit. The amount of energy that was expelled here, if you think about that, is it, pretty hard to grapple with. I think it would be only appropriate that someone from a city like Pittsburgh would work in this media and continue to. The opportunity that Rivers of Steel affords someone like me and Michael who believes very strongly in the ethos of hard work, smart work, forward thinking work, work that does not come easy. This is a place for people like us. So I, I think we're gonna get the conversation started. I'm gonna bring up the slideshow here. So we got some uh, visuals behind us, but if I, I'll welcome Mayor and Walsh up to the stage and we get this rolling here. Thank you all for coming. So, um, actually, just to start off with, we're going to say hold off on the questions um, from you all until the end. We have about 15, 20 minutes at the end that we'll take some questions from the group. But I think to start off with, we'll have a conversation. And um, I think maybe a good place to begin would be way back at you know the beginning, so to speak, and get a sense of you know when. Oh God, I forgot. Microphone. Um, <laughs> you know, when did you start to, to paint graffiti? When did that become you know an interest of yours? And for each of you, want to take it individually, briefly, and kind of give us a starting point. For me, it started um, when I was about ten years old, and it was about uh, 1970, late 75, 76. I started noticing it um, in my neighborhood. It was already happening at least a good ten years before I was involved, and so. It was a, an activity that was happening both for fun, but also as community with graffiti writers in New York City. And one day I saw a piece by Lee Quinones, who's a very famous painter, and I asked questions, who, what, when, where, why, and then I realized, oh, these kids have this clandestine society right under the noses of their parents, and it's both mischief and criminal and all the things I love, so to speak. And, <laughs> and uh, but you had created an alias, so it was it, it was something. It was built around writing, uh, penmanship, and identity building. And so I jumped in, and my brother Kel, who was another prolific painter, he was my co-conspirator, and it, it went from there. And we started seeing that it wasn't just writing to write. There was an aesthetic. It was a developing aesthetic already 10 years in the making around this art form in terms of not just writing, but a graphic design. And as I allude to in this conversation for three-dimensional work, all that was being developed back then. And so that's my earliest um, entry into the, this culture and this movement. How about you, Michael? Mm. So it starts it's complicated, of course, because, you know. But um, I think my first memories of seeing graffiti were in my neighborhood. So Dezez and Smash Money had done a piece that was in spray can art that said Pop Life that was right by a pizza place I used to go and play video games when I was a young kid. And I also noticed all the graffiti that had kind of been from the first generation here in you know, Garfield. There was an abandoned shopping mall, those same writers the busway, and then really famous piece, the Buddha Badburn, which was also featured in spray can art. And I think right at the same time, Thrasher Magazine, of course, was our source for skateboarding, which I was way into. I was seeing 
you know, everything coming out of Venice and this whole look and these like West Coast hands and, you know, just the whole element and what that looked like. And it was attractive because it was outlaw. It was brash. It was in your face. It was the, you know, 80s and 90s. And, you know, it was a time for that. So when people around me started doing it around the hardcore scene, punk rock scene, around skateboarding, they were friends of mine and it just built this natural community through those interactions, which I enjoyed as much as the mischief. I loved stealing paint. I loved doing all that stuff. I loved being a young kid that was saying no to society. I was seeing it and saying, you know, I want to I wanna do something different than that. It built lifelong friends and amazing experiences and, you know, it has me here today and it's introduced me to the world and all these amazing people I know and given me great experiences and was the foundation of becoming an artist. Awesome. That's great. I, and I'm thinking about like the, what it must have been like growing up, well, for you in the Bronx, but for Michael, for you here in the city and with what we're doing in Cary as well now, but thinking about what it must have been like when there was 15 or 16 Carries around, you know, and spaces galore to be painting in. Were, were there other places that resonated with you at that time that, you know, really stand out in your mind as places that were like, you know, the, the, the key places to be painting? I mean, I would go to like, you know, the idea of kids taking the wreckage of the industrial age. There's a lot of commentary about this around graffiti, skateboarding, and all of the critical cultures that really made up the world we have today. And what's now normal was very, you know, avant-garde. I would say that, you know, the cork factory is an absolute one, 23rd Street. I mean, I remember when there was no graffiti in there. I remember when the freight trains had no graffiti on it. I remember, and we did our damnedest to cover everything we could with it, you know? And um, that provided an opportunity to, you know, hide out kind of from everything that was going on too. And gave us our own sense of identity, our own spaces to occupy. They became our art galleries. The Carrie Furnace site, some of the ones at Homestead. And we were completely, you know, oblivious to what this was. They were just amazing places to hang out. And there was also the idea that you had to break in there. And that was fun. That was, that was the best part, quite frankly. You know, it was just this whole mission that you were on, you know, and it felt like you were doing something. And, you know, let's, let's get real. What we both experienced was the demise of that and how it affected our communities. And the, the, the imprint that had on people psychologically, um, financially, their, their health, just all of it, they basically discarded all of us. And we joke around about having very similar experiences in very different places. It was affected by you know, globalization and greed. Yeah, it's, it's, an environmental it's an environmental trauma that plays out. And it, it's, it's interesting because my, when I first got to Pittsburgh, um, and knowing a little bit about Pittsburgh, but not in the way as he's expressing it, um, and then finding some parallels maybe about how industry leaves and tears neighborhoods and communities apart. And, and New York was a very different case in, in one sense that it was so deliberate and obvious. It was literally a crime against humanity and what was happening in the South Bronx, the decade of fire we call it. But we had industry there. Uh, many big things happened there like building parts of the Statue of Liberty. Um, so there was industry there, and once those factories left um, and they built the, the expressway, there went the neighborhood, and where were kids to go? And there was all these abandoned factories and um, the streets and the trains. And that was part of um, the, the, there was an adventure and fun and all of that, but it was also an act of survival. Absolutely, it also gave us an identity in a place that was telling us, you know, we don't really care what you have to say. Be quiet. Like, you know, it, we got to pick our own names. We got to express who we were. And we got to do that with other people. And that's what was so exciting. I've always enjoyed the other people part of that. I, I love that about all these cultures. You go skateboarding with all your homies, or you go paint, and you, like, I can look at a picture and remember who was there, what it smelled like, the jokes that were told, 
the 40s that were drank. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's great, because that was, I think that was such an important part of that. It gave us a community. Well, that's a good, I'm oh, sorry. No, I was just gonna say about the identity building and the name. You know, uh, Mayor is not my last name. Uh, Mayor is short for nightmare. Uh, sort of a quote unquote nightmare kid. But also in terms of style writing and what we know, uh, it comes from that, but also uh, Mare and Latin is the sea, and I love the sea of the ocean, so it makes sense. But yeah, it's, it, identity building was a huge essential part of all this, and it happened, you know, like this, th these collaborations are so in integral into our development as children and into men as well. Yeah, and I think that's exactly kind of where I was headed with this along the conversation of community and, and collaboration and, you know, how did, how did you guys start to work together first? You know, I mean, coming from different, not only different times, but different places entirely, and then all of a sudden, you know, we're here together today. Well, you know, it is about connections. So, Christy Zappon, who came from here, uh, I believe she was from Punxsutawney, actually, originally. But she ended up running the World DMC uh, DJ Championships, and her and I were good friends. And she would literally call me like, "You gotta meet this cat, Mayor. You two are like, you know, this." And was trying to introduce us for many years. And finally, what had happened? I had done this residency in Italy called the Digital Stone Project, which at the time was the first place in the world where there were seven axis stone carving robots where you could go and do an artist residency. There's quite a few that have popped up now in Carrara and some other parts of Italy. There's um, you know, a couple here in the United States, finally. Not necessarily we can do residency, but these are some insanely high-tech tools. To get an opportunity like that, you know, I went to Italy for a month, and I created this project, and I felt like it was very cutting edge for our genre. And Mara had the same sentiment and reached out to me, and we just started talking, and like immediately, it was like we knew each other forever. And we've just continued that dialogue, continued working together have become great friends and great support mechanisms in each other's lives. And, um, you know, I think too, it's like, God, you're just as weird as me. You didn't just paint a painting. You like carrying around heavy shit that nobody buys. Great, that's cool. Um, you know, and, and that goes the same with all the metal casting artists that are out there in the crowd today that like love this thing so much, you know, that they're willing to, you know, pretty much put it all into it regardless. They're doing it for the sake of it. And anything that comes above that's, you know, that's great. But I mean, this is a true passion and can be an extreme obsession. We're, we're in a very unique genre of sculpture in contemporary art. And that, it, as I was expressing before, it's, it, it, did, it didn't exist before. And not until we explored it. But more importantly, once you start, in, my, in an instance of my work, my life's work, it, it is a study in, or dialogue with art history and where, where those parallels lie. And so when I was very young, yet it was with the graffiti artists, but then immediately it started to shift into dialogues with Picasso, Julio Gonzalez, David Smith, uh, you know, Taubman and, 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 and Stella and all these, these, these names, important names in sculpture. And that was one of the things that kind of drew us together too, is that we had, this affinity for um, one genre, but developing it through the lens of other genres, right? And, and picking up that inheritance and pushing that rock forward. Um, and it, and it, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing process because it's, it's, it's happening globally now, but it's again, in terms of what the art market and the art view public knows, they don't quite understand how important that is. Yeah. And that will happen years down the line, if not, I mean, it's, this is a part of it, right? That we, through the support of this program, are able to say in this kind of venue, look, this is an important American genre of sculpture making and art making uh, that has deep roots, deep history. And so that, that's why the film is so important in expressing that to everybody, because it's education for you guys, you know, for, so that you, you, the art lovers, understand that in your lifetime, your living lifetime, you're seeing something important develop. 
Yeah, and I think that's so important, and um, I appreciate you saying that as well about the program. You know, it was great having you guys there and watching things unfold over the week, which I'm sure was not near, anywhere near enough time for the amount of work you guys smashed into it. Did you see my hair? Yeah, that was well, awesome. At least you have some. Ooh, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, no, but I, I think that it's interesting also kind of seeing the work you were doing in the past. And you, you in particular, Mayor, back some of the images that we saw earlier from the, the real early days with the, the sheet metal, and then working with a material like iron that is, you know, otherwise entirely rigid and, un, and unforgiving in so many ways. And you know, how how did you feel, or how do you feel like your work sort of maneuvers that kind of a scenario spatially or as a material? You know, it, I think it's an interesting. This was important, I think, and I said this to Michael uh, that this process made me a real legitimate sculptor. Um, it's it's a time honored tradition. Um, it is a, a a process that is very unlike the, the, the sculptures I made earlier. Uh, the process I had earlier was very deliberate in me being as fluid and efficient as a painter as I was as a painter, and I can do that in any scale and work in that scale and be very successful at it. This is very different because it's a collaborative process. It's the elements, as I point out, um, and there's a different. Um, tactile experience, even I felt it today when I was in front of, when I, you go to the site and I'm seeing them visiting my, my, my friends, my kids again, uh, these, these forms that are dancers, and I'm looking at the surface finish, and, and it's, it, it, it was just, it triggered something about labor, about the hands that touched this, you know, Ed and Paige and people who, Cricket, people who all helped this come to happen. It's not just my hands on this. And so it is a different kind of respect and honor yeah. in that. And so for me as a sculptor, um, it, it, it's just a whole different kind of experience other than, than my traditional process. And it lends itself, I'm gonna say, well, sculpture is a team sport. That's what I like about it, alluding to the community. You know, it's something that I love and struggle with at the same time, you know, being sort of the quintessential temperamental artist type. And, you know, it's like, but that's good too, because like, you know, the, the, the experiences like that, the personal growth, but also too, the way that all these processes, you know, kind of, I mean, it's like you make the work for the process. That's what's interesting as a sculptor. So when you're talking about how he worked, early works of mine were sheet metal, they were, you know, more arduous because I don't know. I just tend to gravitate towards that. But you know, the same sort of thing. It's like, and then you know, when I, I mean, actually, you know, Ed Parrish turned me on to metal casting. He's like, this is perfect for you. You have to do this. I don't know whether to thank him or throw my shoe at him. But the, um, no, all kidding aside, that led me down so many different ways of thinking about work. It work made me work with so many different materials. So now at this point. Whether I'm in virtual reality, which is something I'm doing now, and 3D printing these objects, and working with robotics companies, which is like, you would think is far removed from this, but it is just a part of the linear extension of the industrial age, moving now into this new sort of opportunity. That, that, and and that, that, you know, the work that we're making, the process helps inform it. That's, part, that's always been part of sculpture. And that's what's so nice, there's limitations, there's parameters. And that's good. Without limitations, you'll just keep going forever. Yeah. Well, I also think, you know, when, you, when you're alluding to how you're using technology, VR and AR, and in, in this virtual world, moving in space, making something, it, for some reason it just it, it went back into my mind, you know, like almost a return back to painting, where you're in space in some sort of site-based location, doing something quick and fast, and in a weird way, a return back to the beginning, but in a much more technological uh, perspective. Can I, can I address that? Because you're hitting the nail. No, you are absolutely hitting the nail on the head. After all this work, I mean, that one white sculpture that's there, I just want to use that example, or like the cosmic carousel. I mean, you're talking about four months of a team to build that. I mean, I mean, we went insane. It was like 15 hours a day that you go out and you do this whole thing. And then all of a sudden I get in VR, you know, and that's, I mean, at the end of that, I was in bed for a month. I mean, you know, it's like, I go into VR, it's peaceful. All of a sudden, the line work of the can is back, you know, my muscle memory. And I'm just like, you know, it's like the immediacy is back. 
the spontaneity is back. And quite frankly, because I listen to music and channel it, and as a musician as well, I use all of that as sort of something energetically. So it's hard to translate it to this. You know, it kind of looks frozen, whereas this new medium offers something that actually looks like it's floating and moving. So it comes back, and you, it's, it's, you know, and it's really an amazing opportunity, especially for someone like a graffiti sculptor. You know, a sculptor traditionally would carve a stone block or, you know, make something out of clay or wax. But us, we're like on the run, man. You know, we got to get this done in 20 minutes, man. You know, like, and, and we got to get out of here. I want to piggyback yeah, on yeah. that because, because I, I, you know, it's interesting because I've been in tech a long time with Michael as well. And there's, I get some criticism by my analog friends about, you know, sculpt, where sculpture is going and work, the process. And I have to tell them, I was like, look, there was such a, something so liberating about um, an economical about working digitally um, and, and that, as he points out, that we can work in VR and in 3D print and then take that to a bigger process, to a fully realized process. And, you know, it is, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of like, you, know, you need to make art of your time with the tools of your time. And, but you don't discount the tools that were already invented. Uh, and the most powerful being the pencil. And so, you know, that said, it's just yet another tool in your pocket, um, but nothing comes close to the arduous work of something like this. It, there's a different kind of satisfaction in, in, in it, and, and, and the lasting maybe pain, or lasting scars, lasting burns. Uh, and yeah, so it's all of that that is in the, you know, part of, part of the package. Well, just to read that for just a second, I mean, and this is digital media being applied um, from directly that. Good choice of slides right in a row. That was serendipitous. But no, yeah, I mean, like, the reality is, is those things can coalesce. I think a lot of times, like, I corrected someone once. They're like, Pittsburgh's now a tech center. I'm like, it always has been. It's just the tech of the time was somebody scaling up a Bessemer furnace, or was in, in, you know, engineering a brake that's still manufactured for a freight train. And now what we're able to do through computation is extend upon that, you know, like the Jacquard loom change with punch card technology, the way that fabric was produced. And, and this accrued knowledge is not like this lane and that lane. What's beautiful is that, you know, what I saw immediately was like, how can I apply this to metal casting? How can I also streamline the process? Because one of my large goals now is to make less waste. I see all this waste I've created all these years. And you know, I think that, speaking of the art of our time, one of the dilemmas that we face as artists, as human beings, is how do we stop having so drastic an impact on our environment that every living thing on this planet is suffering or in decline? And that's very new for me these last few years, but I'm very, you know, I see this as a pathway forward. You can literally make the work, you can render it, you can show it to people, they see it, they're like, wow, you can make little prototypes, there's very little waste. And then if it needs to be made larger, or it needs to be made with one of these industrial processes, let's do that, and then let's also figure out a way forward with how does the technology evolve with that as well. Yeah. And that's really interesting, you know? I think that's that's a really interesting thing to consider, the like the demo, the democratic and economic end of it, you know, where you can have this, you can have it both ways, essentially. The same thing, large, small, it, it's very consumable in some cases, and you have these special things that's very, you know, the art of our time, as Nicole kind of mentioned, is very sort of Warholian as an idea and a great location for that. And I think that, Mary, you also have a connection having met Andy at one point in time, I think, right? Yeah. And maybe, the, uh, you know, what yeah. was there a kind of, what, what came of that, I suppose? Well, what, what's about serendipitous that? about all of this, which is crazy, is that when I was younger and I started doing my first sculptures, uh, I, I met Andy uh, through various friends in New York. And, of course, he's ubiquitous with New York City and the club scene and the art scene. Um, but he had Interview Magazine, and, and I had friends who worked for him. Um, and he, in fact, what was quite you know, touching was my son's grandmother 
Bridget Bernstein um, has an illustration of her um, at, up there, Diane Abbott, who's married to Bob De Niro, and uh, and I was like, wow, this is this is pretty intense. This comes a little closer, um, and uh, and interestingly enough, my friend it, it, it had, Antonio Lopez was the one who introduced me to a famous illustrator who has some illustrations here. And it was interesting because I, we as graffiti artists and the kids on the scene were like, we were hot and happening, but we weren't part of like the grown-up scene. The grown-ups were coming down to hang out with us. And uh, next thing you know, Mick Jagger and all these folks were coming around to hang out. And Andy was somebody that was always around and then I would meet him at Antonio Lopez studio and, and then at Interview Magazine where I came up when I first started doing the sculptures. And he was very encouraging and, and you know, in his very soft-spoken voice, he used to give me advice and he, I didn't take some of it because he's look, hang it in a coffee shop, hang it here, you never know who's gonna see it. But that was him back in the day. He was putting his work everywhere he could. And so um, that connection was really interesting and important to me because there were, we were crossing these parallels in our lives that were very interesting. I've realized here in terms of his life as a young artist because he was a window dresser at Bergdorf. I was a window dresser at Bergdorf for a period. Uh, he was always in Studio 54, and believe it or not, as a kid I worked at Studio 54. Uh, but that, that was the second phase. Um, but he became increasingly important when, when he was hanging out with uh, Jean-Michel and, and, and Keith. And Keith, of course, picking up um, where Andy left off in kind of this democratization of art, uh, just to another whole nother level towards the public, access to the public. And so that was very interesting for me to have been around in those days to see how Andy was uh, influencing youth, youth culture, meaning you know the up and coming artists that they were, but even as even the break dancers. I mean, the, the work that I'm doing is based on break dancers, but abstracted, uh, more rel related to um, uh, people like Kandinsky's work and, and then ultimately Keith Haring's work, but that Andy really was kind of this person that allowed us to, to consider our, ourselves, our, our work to be applied across multiple mediums as much as possible. And, and so for me, that was kind of a, an imprint, so to speak, um, that um, at, at prof as a professional artist, because we were already doing that well before you know, that uh, we met him. But I think as a professional artist about um, applying yourself to multiple mediums and disciplines. And as you can see here, when you look at how many things he did in terms of film, photography, and so on. So um, it's a real honor to be here and to even share that story. Um, and, and it's funny, because in my head, I'm just thinking of a moment of being at the underground club with a broken leg and, and standing next to him, and he says nothing for like 15 minutes. We're just standing there looking at people dance, because I can't dance. <laughs> really, really bizarre. So that's some of my Andyisms. That's great. Um, it, so you kind of got a little bit in, into that conversation about your work, which I realized both of you we haven't talked a whole lot about. You know, kind of where it comes from, and it, there's a little bit in the film about some sort of high-level inspirations. But what you yield, individual as artists, is very different. You know, it, it seems like it comes from similar places in, in many respects, but, you know, Walsh, your stuff, especially, you know, what was created for this residency is, like, monolithic and massive, and, you know, it's it's huge. And Mary, even though yours, each one weighs 800 pounds, it still has this lightness to it. I mean, you know, I like the one shot in the video where it's just sort of spinning right in your, in your face, but I, I'm kind of curious if you maybe want to talk a little bit about the, the people that you really kind of look to whenever you're in that in the creative process and you're channeling something that's that's really strong. You know, Walsh, you talked a lot about music being key for you. You know, maybe a little bit more about how that yields what you end up with in the end. Yeah, I mean, I can remember going to the Cork factory warehouse and, um, you know, I used to take these journeys because I knew it would open up places in my mind, in my soul, we'll put it that way. And 
closing my eyes and literally with a Walkman on listening to Axis Bold as Love and trying to paint what I was hearing the guitar. So like all the arpeggios. So you still see that in my work. I think that I'm interested in everything as long as it's a good version of it. I'm not interested in if it's slop. So like, I see the things that are similar instead of dissimilar. So, you know, Frank Zappa said, of course, there are no genres, there's just music. I feel the exact same way. So if I'm looking at Soro Itro's sculpture, or I'm looking at this piece of architecture, or I'm looking at a machine part, or something that's painted, or a text, or listening to something, um, you know, and that can be like, sometimes I think I experience synesthesia. You know, I literally can take music and I can see color and I can express that in an instrument. I express that into the art, and especially drawing graffiti letters. Like, we did an experiment. I want, I want to talk about this. Actually, this is going to go off topic, so maybe I'll address this later. Okay, I'll go off topic. <laughs> well, no, when, when the first consumer virtual reality Oculus Rifts were available with uh, 3D software, I went to the New York Institute of Technology, and as opposed to just trying one of these, you know, sort of tech products, I set up speakers all around their motion capture studio with, and I had playlists. So like one of them was like, you know, James Brown, Fela, like all this stuff that just was hard drive and funk, stuff that would have really psychedelic or atmospheric um, sort of, you know, um, tendencies. And I was in a motion capture suit with a VR headset, which is pretty daunting, like first go around. But literally, they were blasting this music with speakers so I could feel it. I looked ridiculous, and I'm there, like, I'm in this suit with, like, you know, silver balls all over in this headset. The pictures are hilarious. But what was rendered from that was, in real time, my body, the way it was moving. We have that data. And I was literally just sculpting the music, and that was the first time I could do it. You know, and that, I, and what I was thinking about while that was all going on is just, you know, what's in here? that I've looked at and like how can all of that turn into this one thing you know and I, that's what I'm interested in which is somewhat confusing to describe to people you know because it's really easy to know what something is if it's a genre or it's marketed or boxed in this particular way but as you know defeatist as this might be for like you know like the art market you know I want to just keep experimenting whatever and see what's possible as soon as something new pops up I want to play with it you know, I want to see how I can apply all the stuff from this point forward and any of the influences that are around me now to it. So I went way off topic, but no, I think that was great. And I, it actually kind of draws me into another correlation between your work it is this kind of sense of movement. And, you know, I'm thinking about you in the motion capture suits and thinking about your work for the B-Boy series and, and just more broadly speaking. And, and then I'm also, it, it it's making me think about the history of mapping human movement and how that's connected to industrialization, which is, just also happens to be something I'm interested in as an artist as well, but scientific management and thinking about how we capture movement, a captured movement then that turned into roboticization and ultimately replacing human workers with robots. And so you've got this like really deep and beautiful connection to tragedy, but also to like the beauty of dance and movement and I just think that's a really interesting yeah, To piggyback on that, it's it, my work, a special interest of mine very, when I was very young, because I'm in New York City, so I get to see some of the most important shows and works in the world. And, and I literally lived between train tunnels and museums as a kid. And I was really attracted to the early 20th century Paris, uh, Italy, and, and Russia. And, and you know they were in the, the new industrial age, and so artists were reinterpreting um, their lives, uh, or, or their lives, you know, the landscapes, but also movement, especially the futurists, and you look at that work, those lines, and I started drawing those parallels to what I was experiencing as a graffiti artist. Uh, as a graffiti artist, our, that experience is absolutely industrial. You're, you're going into train tunnels, train tracks, these huge trains, they're engineered, and you remember every single detail of them, even so much of the smell, um, and and even tracks and elevated tracks. And so, I started kind of connecting to some of the ideas of the past, 
and what they were exploring. And, and so, for instance, uh, the early 20th century, they, they broke apart the landscape. Um, we broke apart the alphabet and, and, and abstracted the alphabet. Um, and so, in terms of the work that I do, that was really kind of the first, you know, I started doing the graffiti letters and they, I found them to be too easy. And then when I started looking at the Russian constructivists and all this stuff, I started saying, oh yeah, you know what, this is that. But it also, it, it comes back to this other part of my, my, my history, which is music, art, and dance. And there's rhythms and there's the ways that we, you know, right, we share this muscle memory of like, boom, bat, boom, bat, boom. You know, there's all this movement um, in the act of painting, but also dancing. And so when you look at those b-boy abstracts, even though they are static, that is a snapshot, that is a distillation of the body that is in movement, and in an absolute movement. You know, if he's doing a head spin, it's a head spin, and a back spin, it's a back spin. And so, you know, in, in that sense, that's part of that exploratory work. But it took years to, to, to kind of figure it out, even though I was well aware of it in, as, as far back as 1980. It wasn't until 2005 when I was in front of a, uh, this artist, Mark de Suvero, uh, amazing sculptor, industrial sculptor, industrial size, very important American genius, this guy. And once I saw the forms, and I said, oh yeah, that makes sense. And then I saw some things uh, you know, through the, the modernists, and I said, oh, that makes sense. So now I'm not creating a cartoon caricature of, um, of a dancer. It's something that has been explored in the early 20th century, especially through Moybridge and photography and stuff. So the things that I'm, even though I'm like an urban person and kind of of the hip hop genre, there's a, you know, a deep affinity for art history and also remixing art history. And, and like I said before, taking that inheritance and pushing it forward in all these new mediums. I did want to address something I don't talk about enough because it had to inform me and does. Similarly to dance and b-boying, which I was really aware of here, you know, um, and really enjoy, but you know, wasn't so immersed in it. For us, it was skateboarding. So like, there are certain tricks that just, especially if someone styles it, and like you do a great Smith grind, it's just like, and you're held in this motion. And I look at like, the way that even my graffiti letters moved, and I see like a 360 kick flip, which is a gorgeous trick, when someone just lands at all bolts, or someone does a beautiful invert on a vert ramp, and they're on one arm, and they, you know, come back in, and it's it's really fluid the motion. I think that that was my because my body was moving like that all the time. I mean, just pay attention to his body movement as he <laughs> says it, right? Well, I'm from Highland Park. We you know we talk with our hands. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah. But no, I mean that. I think that really informs it. I think that when we're touching on all these similarities, this is our dialogue. I mean, I think we're just scratching the surface because even today, I'm finding out more about the depth of your practice and the way that you are relating to the work. And you know, I've, I'm you know thinking about things in a different way through this conversation. Yeah, I think it, it's it's great. It kind of comes back to that notion of collaboration again that we started with at the beginning and how important it is to the overall genre. Also, how important it is to the metal casting piece of it, which comes together in a unique fashion in this particular residency. Um, and I know you had just given a talk a little bit uh, recently about more in depth about collaborative practice in your own work. And I, have you guys ever worked on a a single piece together in the past on anything oh. that more direct, or it's all been. In yeah, kind we of might have to do that. That might be really tight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should do that. That's, That's a good it, idea. It, it, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 it's it's very interesting. It's interesting for me as a, as a sculptor I, and as an artist. It, the way I collaborate is is not directly. It is in parallel, and it's intellectually too. And, and, it, and it's, it's a whole different kind of rigor in, in that way for me. And I've yet to do that really in terms of the painting. When we're painting, yes, I, I work with other painters and collaborate, you know. Um, but yeah, I. I'd be fun. It'd, it'd be a it, challenge for both of us because, be. you know, you ever do like that exercise where you draw something and you hand it to the next person and they draw something? Yeah. I mean, that would be. Wizard Corpse. 
Uh, yeah, it'd be really interesting to do that with sculpture, but I think that the, again, I'll go back to technology, the VR environment, where you can have the shared environment is the perfect place to do that, because literally, he can be in Florida, I can be in California, or wherever, because that's the beauty of this thing. Like, I want to turn my studio into something I put in my backpack, so I can be anywhere. That's the, that's something and, we spoke about today. And that, we're, that's we're there. The, that's the we're next there. phase yeah, we're much there. of collaborating, and, yeah. and, and it is... It is, it, it, it's interesting because collaboration, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned I just gave a talk, actually I was in Saudi Arabia, I gave a talk about my life through collaboration with people and artists. And the first place I start is on the street with kids and how we collaborated as kids. Um, and then there was this other kind of virtual collaboration. Well, I'm a graffiti writer from the Bronx and you're from Brooklyn. Well, I'm going to travel through this high-speed network of trains to get to you. Um, and again, translating that to where we are, just as he said, that um, we could find a new playground for ourselves in this virtual space that can actually create a tangible good, a result. Um, and so I think that, that is obviously the next phase in, in, in what we're exploring. Yeah, I think that sounds great. I'd love to see what come of that. We do as human beings build everything on these networks. So whether you're studying mycelia and the way that that grows, or you're thinking about the World Wide Web, or you're thinking about you know, our neural capacity, it's like everything functions that way. When you're talking about that train, that's built on the same kind of system. And I kind of try to tap into that you know, and think like that when I'm doing this stuff. I actually try to get out of the way. You know, a lot of artists have really like, heavy concepts. It has to be this way. And there's a seven page write up next to it. I want to actually get out of the way. I want to feel it. You know, I want it to. I want to channel it. I want to allow the end user to have their own individual experience with it. And it is through like when I started studying how three D printers worked. Ironically, at the same time, I was trying to study how my mind worked, reprogram it. And what I realized is like if you send good data from the computer to a three D printer, then you get the object that works out, but if it's messed up and your body works the same way. So if you're thinking like crazy negative thoughts, you're dumping cortisol all through your body. Yeah. You know, you're getting a bunk print, you know? So, <laughs> so, so it's interesting because I'm listening yeah. to him speak yeah. and I'm I kind of caught it and, and I realize how different we are in that way and, and what we're, how we're looking and approaching art, right? And, and it, it's very deep in where he's going with it. And for me, it, it's, it's kind of, in a very su surface level in my mission and my work because it, it, it's very academic and it's about bridging. Uh, it's about bridging culture and, and, and I think it's part of the defense mechanism, right? Because I mean, how many young Puerto Rican artists are represented in museums and, and are even considered for these kind of conversations? So there was always, since I was young, in these spaces defending this culture but using the same kind of language and um, uh, history to bridge that, right? Because there is there is a, there is a purpose to all of that. That's why I say my work is this dialogue with art history, and yet there yeah, there are all these other parts. But it's like a, there's a part of me that wish there was maybe something, maybe in some way as deep as that. I'm just I'm not, out on the bay. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's my <laughs> thing. But again, there is something deeply purposeful in, in, in this work that will outlive me for uh, generations before me. And I understand that. And I, know, and I also understand when the works are truly fluid and you know, representational of where I am in life or in the world, because some of these works are, you know, if I'm in the Middle East, the work reflects that. If I'm in Europe, it reflects that. If I'm in Latin America, it reflects that. Um, but ultimately, it's kind of um, a gateway impression, so to speak, that will, um, that speaks to younger people, but also educates older people. Uh, that's a good kind of place to jump in. I wanna keep us on track to make sure we have some time for folks to ask questions. But, you know, switching gears a little bit, coming off your the end of your comment there I'm thinking about you know, the roles that you've each of you have had in kind of the, the larger community education the importance of that in your whether you know in your own work as an educator or having been educated from somebody in one other in one way or another 
And given that a piece of the industrial grid and graffiti program is very heavily involved in community and youth education around the, the content and the subject matter, I wonder, you know, how you both feel about that, and, and you know how that might have intersected with your own work at various moments. Yeah. Well, well, the success again. It, we all operate in a very interesting way. Like, if we see, we have to see ourselves in others, right, to see what's possible. And and it's what I love about what he said about this process, like he brought me into this process that either you find in a university or you have to be brought in somehow. And I've always wanted to do it, but it just, it just wasn't available. And there was nobody else in my genre, in my space, that was doing it other than you. So that was just perfect for me, and he was my teacher and educator for me. And so when I think about the role as an artist and educator um, in, in my journey, um, it's been really um, focused on um, not just process, uh, you, the, the processes, but how you process that process to give it to somebody else to process. And that, if that makes sense. No, it does. That's because it, it's, it, it's it, 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 again, it, we're in a, we're, are, we are in such an automated space in time that you press a button and something happens and you don't think of anything of it. And so, and for me, like I said, as, an, as somebody who's an educator, I had to like, face off with art critics and museums and directors and, and like, there's very little wiggle room because I'm, I'm versed in a very unique space and I'm more versed in this space as well. And so it's not about, for me, it is about, a, it's, it almost becomes a social justice issue Right? Because when I came up, um, you know, black artists and women artists were not getting those opportunities. And so the education that I got right off from people like the Gorilla Girls, you know, and, and you know what I'm saying? And, and it was hardcore when I was a kid to see all this protest work and people who were marginalized um, and very good artists speak up, but also go back towards education. And so that is a big part of the work, and it's a big part of this process here, because you're extending an education uh, to somebody like me, then that others around the world who get to see this and speak to me about it, are like, how do I, how do I do this? How do, you know, like, you did it. All of a sudden, me and Michael are these beacons for other people to say, how does how can we be down with the program? Well, I mean that is part of the idea of why I started. I researched 3D printing in 2006, seven, and was like, whoa, you know, wow, this is revolutionary, this idea. I'm like, you know, I started really thinking about it. This is like building geology, but then I started to think, I'm like, wait a minute, because, you know, being not marginalized the same way, but like being in an environment that was not very um, supportive. In fact, like, you know, I can remember going to an older sculptor and trying to get some, you know, educate, you know, hey man, I want to learn how to weld, I want to learn. And they, he was like, that graffiti art shit you make is fucking rubbish, and I will do everything I can, he literally said this to me, to make sure no one ever sees this, and you guys should just stop doing that now. And I was like, you're going to eat your words. There was also a college admissions thing I went to, and basically I had portfolio of my paintings at the time and at the time separated it to these like really psychedelic looking wild style graffiti pieces and they're looking at you know at the time like okay surrealist painting which happened what like a hundred years ago already and they're like oh this is great this is great and then I turn to what is just fresh off the presses and they go we do not even consider that and that happened at multiple interviews and you know, I told them all, you're gonna eat your words because this is gonna be a big thing. Back to education though, I think that your program, for example, speaks to youth in a way that's different. If you wanna get kids interested in art, you know, graffiti is a great way to do it because it's already part of their environment and it is a folk art of the people. And of you know, marginalized people, working people, and it's transcended that completely, that's its origin point. We can, through that, of course, that's almost like the gateway drug. But imagine a kid can now walk into, uh, hopefully, a school that has a good computer program, a library for free, and sculpt. Maybe a kid like from the projects, 
who is not going to buy a welder, who doesn't have access to people, his community doesn't have that infrastructure, or, or hers, or whatever. And they can then create sculpture through these mediums. I like, I want to leave all the stuff I figured out on the table and go, here, man, have that. And here's all the stuff I figured out. You know, now you do something with it, and please extend on those ideas. And hopefully, like, there'll be a more diverse group of people then that can be a voice in this medium from all kinds of different backgrounds, because this could apply on a, you know, we often just think about the United States, which is absurd. But in a more global sense, you know, if someone has access to this stuff, you know, then they can be wherever, in whatever type of community. And then that gives an entire different, you know, that puts so much different work into the stream. It opens up so many different opportunities. You know, and I think we all educate each other. I'll, I'll also say that. I, I learned something to, just right now. I mean, today when we were talking, I learned stuff, you know, between the banter. I, I learned some really interesting things, you know, like we talked, this, this, this dialogue that's created. I try to learn something every day. I mean, I'm on YouTube doing tutorials of the most random shit. And, yeah, and, you know, let me interject on that for yeah, a second, because yeah. this is what's so interesting. He's talking about education and, 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 and how he learns as an artist. This genre is built on kids teaching kids. Yes. It's built on that and continues to build on that worldwide. And what's really fascinating is that these kids grow up. And they're in a different time, and they have a different. Some of us. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm serious. I, I, I'm blown away. You know, like, I, I was, I was. Look, for instance, I was, I'm looking at this video, YouTube video. This young kid, 20 something years old, phenomenal, phenomenal at his age, and and I look at him, and all of a sudden, I start getting a little. Shit, you're 57. You can't even draw, like, like that. You know. And, but he has learned from everything else that was already done before, all the work that I did and others did to get him to that level. And not just that, these kids have created tools that are very specific, spray paints, that are very specific in color and pressure um, and chemicals, um, markers, uh, and even digital software. So it's a whole different world that is walking into this, 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 this genre, so to speak. And it's not, again, before it was just like, oh, just marginalized hood people, poor people and whatnot, but it's not that. Yeah. It's not that at all. And, uh, and not only that, we are all reaching into the most contemporary spaces of art. Um, he's shown at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, MoMA has some of my work. I just did a show at um, the Fort Wayne Museum um, that was about abstract painting. Yeah, I mean, I never thought that I would show marble sculpture in Italy in Pietro Santo, where yeah. Constantine Brancusi's studio was, and I mean, Osama Noguchi worked there. And I mean, when I was walking through that that space and being able to do that and experience that, I like realized how like I had I'm walking down the same path as these amazing people that I, I just honor, and you know. And, and I looked at their work, and I actually skipped back to modernism before, but, you know, when you were talking about influences. So I was just completely taken aback by that. I mean, I came back a changed person from that experience. The, the nicest compliment I ever got in my life was there. And the head of the Sculptors Guild in Italy was like an 82 or 83 year old woman. She had two guys that had to help her around, and she sought me out, and she came up, and the translator said to me, she said to me, most Americans are not sculptors. They're, and fair enough, because Italy and that region, that's, you know, that is their, that's their stuff, man. And like, tread lightly, be there, honor that, don't bring you to that, let that, you know. And she said to me, but you are a sculptor. And she gave me a kiss on the cheek. And that was the nicest thing. I was just completely taken aback, especially being a graffiti writer. So that one experience where this guy who was working in academia was like, that's trash. But then being in the place and how far we've come, being in the place where that sculpture, man, Italy, you know, stonework, and someone to say something that to me, that wasn't just about me, that was about our genre because we were, you know, we were all lifting each other up. And each move that someone makes, may it be Futura or Cause or whomever, or someone right now who we have no idea who it is that's, that's standing on the shoulder of giants, 
and you know, as they say, the you know, the student should, you know, surpass the teacher. Yeah. These people are bringing art into this next era, and the you know, could you imagine when we were stealing fat caps and putting cans down our pants that there'd be all this stuff? I had, but it, but it's also yeah. not by. I'm going to underscore this because it's not by accident. Because the generation before me, in the '70s, you know, some of those guys had aspirations to be in museums. Uh, there's footage of that. Um, they were organized as well. Um, they, you know, even a group of them, uh, uh, NOGA, Nation of Graffiti Artists, they, they all collaborated with Twyla Thorpe in a phenomenal presentation, stage presentation. So they, it was there. And, and of course, in New York City, we had vocational schools for art. Uh, so there were several prominent art schools that were teaching art and art history and stuff. And of course, the museums. But that wasn't what was driving that generation. It was my generation that was, was the one that was thinking critically about our relationship with galleries and so on and so forth. But in, in, in part, that's part of what was interesting about Andy was that it was people, when people like that started taking note of us, everybody, oh, they're hanging out with break dancers and graffiti artists. And you know, Fab Five Freddy was here recently talking about that. Uh, he was always around on the scene. He was one of the, uh, you know, persons who brought uptown and downtown together. Um, He's doing it again. I mean, he was working for Burning Man this year. Yes, yeah, so you know, he, wow, just wow. It's just know? bridging. But yeah. that, the, just to say that this isn't really new to the genre to us. It's just that we were not cultivated in that space as we are cultivated now. Okay. It's yeah. It's become. You know, it's its own thing now, where we were fighting. We're no longer fighting to say this is legit. I mean, yeah. I woke up with a headache many times trying to break through that wall. It was like, no. Yeah. But we very much are here. And, 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 and now I'll add to this, just yeah, interject yeah, yeah, on sure. this thought, that you, you know, three years ago, I went to Miami. I'm a co-founder co of the Museum of Graffiti. Mm -hmm. And it's just a small space that you know, was focused on the history of graffiti. Um, and it's past and present, and it's impact. And there are more museums like that in the world, in Berlin and in Europe, especially Europe is especially keen on the study and history and scholarship of this work. Um, and we are slowly getting into that space here in America. It, it, it is rather unusual how America is about art and culture. Mm -hmm. it's, it's always behind the curve in honoring its own. Um, and it's, you know, just music, Jimi Hendrix, he, he left and you know, boom, boom, came back, <laughs> came back a hero. But yeah. that said, graffiti is a uniquely American art form, even though it's an act that predates us in time, right? Yeah. And we're talking about contemporary graffiti, or style writing. We like to call it style writing. Most people know it as it's graffiti. I think in the interest of time and wanting to give a chance for everybody to uh, have a, a, a question or two. If there are any out there, maybe we'll end it with that. Sounds Thank good. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So, so I think we have a microphone floating around out here. Nicole has it. Um, it's your turn. Anybody have any questions? Thank you. You are here. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as graffiti, graffiti art has like progressed into like the mainstream um, and people can now look at the type of work that you do um, or look at murals and look at things that are like on legal walls and legal spaces, um, often I've, I've noticed that those people who can appreciate those art forms will at the same time say, well, that's what I want to see in graffiti that's what I like about these this letter style thing, but they'll still denounce and put down illegal forms of graffiti, even though that is the origin of, of the art form. So I, I guess, how do you respond to the people who are so willing to, to just belittle vandalism art, um, and, and how do you try to educate them in, on that issue? Usually, I. Here's the thing about that, right? That 
Vandalism is vandalism. It's a crime, right? It's nothing new. It's been around for millennia, right? And that there's a legitimate gripe for a property owner or community to, you know, have an issue with it. I don't, I, you know, I, I don't have a problem with that. But I also know that there is also another type of gripe that people have about public space and being part of public space and owning public space and having space in public space, um, which is increasingly difficult for people and young people to feel like they belong in a community. Now, there's also this copycat theory, right? If you write your name and I'm your best friend, I'm like, well, that's cool, he's cool, I'll do it. That's one part of it. And there are then legitimate people who are, are in this, glow, this race, so to speak, who can do more. And this is, uh, this is kind of a nod to Andy, you know, repetition. The more you do, the more you get seen, the more you're known, the more you're famous, right? Your hood famous. There's that. Then there are the style writers, people who really practice the, you know, the art of style writing and complete productions and so on. And, and on then and the, they're the muralists. People call them street artists. I, I think that cheapens it. I think they're muralists in the tradition of muralism. Um, so there's space for everyone. And you may not agree with it. You, you, you know, I, 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 don't have to, I, I don't like to try to defend any of it. It, it. it has to exist. And I say it has to exist. Because people need outlets. You know? And there's consequence. You gotta know, like, if you're willing to destroy somebody's property, you gotta be willing to live with the consequence of that if you get caught. I, I think you have to break some eggs to make an omelet. I mean, the reality is, this all comes from the legal act of it. It all, in some way, does. Whether there's, you know, the argument over which three, there's three cities where this all kind of started happening at once and who started it. But they all share the fact that this was all in public space. No one was asking for permission. And quite frankly, that's the part I like about it, is you're not asking for permission. And, you know, I, I, I'll double down on you. Yes, if you're gonna break the law, don't do the crime if you can't actually do the time, right? So like, you know you're dealing with that. As far as these opinions, that's kind of an old conversation. I feel like, you know, why wouldn't someone be pissed off about someone vandalizing something? Okay, let's move on. Like, okay, that's subjective. You like this thing, you don't like this thing. But the fact is, like, I think as artists, you have to take risks. If it's too safe, maybe you're not pushing yourself hard enough. And if, you know, some people don't like it, that's life. Some people don't like jazz, you know? I mean, whatever. You know, it's also what it is that you, you particularly like. And I, I don't think you can really have a conversation with someone who's already made a determination that this is illegal or this is not good because of that. That's not a conversation. So, you know, if you chose to, you could maybe try to make them understand how some young kid who decides to do this can turn into, you know, an educator, someone that's a major community. I don't know. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. You or you. Oh, <laughs> well, you know, I'm not touching that one. But, you know, so, no, but I mean, I think that conversation is difficult to have in the way that, I mean, it's all relevant, you know? And I agree, things that are illegal, as a, like I don't particularly write on other people's property anymore because I got to a, per, a place where I just didn't want to hurt anybody. You're also a property owner. I am a property owner. That's right. I wrote, well, I write on my own shit. <laughs> it's all over my building. But, you know, um, yeah, and I, I, I understand their gripe. But, like, the reality, too, is, is this entire art form creeps out of the illegality. People transcend that as they move forward into utilizing the space that's permissive. There's people who, you know, straddle that, like, parallel, like the muralists that use the same space and occupy the same space. It's, you know, it's all good. Yeah, it really is. Next question. One over here, Caitlin. Yeah, um, thank you, this has been awesome. Can you hear me? There's a mic coming for you. Yeah. All right, thanks. This was really uh, fascinating and thought-provoking, and I really appreciate it hearing everyone's perspectives. Um, a few key terms have emerged in this conversation. One is public space. The other one is infrastructure um, and education. So I was taken with your discussion of uh, VR as kind of a portable virtual laboratory that enables collaboration sort of across times and spaces. But we also know that a lot of platforms are privatized. So can you speak a little bit about how 
in an ideal world, um, what are some sort of infrastructures that you all would like to see uh, to enable kind of the democratization of some of the cross-genre work that you're doing? Well, that's, that's, wow, that's, that's pretty, I gotta really think about that for a second. I would say this, I mean, someone is paying a lot of money to develop this stuff, and I agree with you, like the ideas and the promise of the internet and its democratization makes a lot of sense. And, you know, the majority of the world is capitalist. So some of that stuff is interwoven in there. But, you know, it is still giving an opportunity. For example, like most of the software right now is almost free or free. So that's one way that anyone could afford it and therefore use it in that way, not, not literally. What is going to continue to happen is people are going to stay ahead of the curve and develop different ways of either communicating or ways of creating platforms that they could work on. So the ones we see now aren't necessarily the ones that will be here in some time. And, you know, as I always would say, is if you're feeling that, like find the people and, and develop it because people will utilize it and they continue to in order to kind of escape the confines of the system and things of that nature. There's also with technology that just, I'm gonna go back to my early days in tech with these young guys that were hardcore programmers, they were GRL, graffiti research labs. And they were utilizing technology um, in many ways on and off lines to be subversive, to be creative. Um, and that was kind of an early iteration of, of you know, this, uh, uh, what do you call it, non-destructive graffiti, so to speak. Um, now, in terms of the kind of infrastructure developing that's interesting to me are these metaverses, right? And these, these artificial experiences you have. That's, that's again, that's a generation that's walking into that. Um, I don't think that, and particularly in this genre that's so youth driven, that, um, you know, that will have that much of a pull as it does in the real world because you have this real world excitement and adrenaline rush from you know going to places you shouldn't go and writing on property you shouldn't write and so on and the, the risk factor and the, the the one issue we have here uh, unfortunately not just here but in you know growing increasingly around the world is this um, demonization of the youth in groups um, and so that becomes an issue as to how kids can congregate and hang out and have fun and in what spaces they can actually do that. And so the new infrastructure is a constricted infrastructure and managed infrastructure to make older people feel safe, right? And uh, it's true. And young people are gonna rebel against that in one form or another, but now the, the unfortunate part that the, the the stakes are much higher in terms of criminalization for mischief, let's just say. Um, so ultimately, infrastructures such as this, right, and infrastructure projects like this, like Rivers of Steel, that gives access to the community to go and work in that space, whether you're gonna go spray paint on those walls or you're gonna cast, those are time Proved, true improvement processes for community building um, that are important to continue to support. I think there was another question up in the back there. Somebody have their hands up? Um, sometimes on my walk to school, I see I walk by this alleyway and it's filled with graffiti. And what are some of the consequences that happened to you when you did graffiti on other people's property? Well, <laughs> well, are you, I, I, are, you, are you an adult with a really small voice? I love, I, I love the question, and, and, and thank you for asking. And. And as we were saying, if you're going to write on somebody else's property, that's a crime. And you have, to, you have to accept the consequence of that, whether you get caught and they make you clean it, or they arrest you and you have to pay a fine. Uh, it's one or the other. 
Um, but some people can just ask, can I just paint a mural on your wall? Can I paint my name on your wall? And I don't know that we know the space that you're referring to, but it also could be a legal space that was, you know, commissioned, so to speak, um, for that purpose, because that's happening a lot as well. And we do a lot of that work with Rivers of Steel. So I think maybe one more question we have time for. Oh, thank you. Um, I've been to the Cary Farnes, and my friends from out of town kept saying, you should go there. It's part of your history. So I did go, and I felt that there were, I don't know if it's spirits or whatever, but you made the historical presence so important by your artwork, and I just applaud that because it brought young people, they were on my tour, and when I went in there and they explained to me how hot it was in there, I thought that your artwork really captured that. So thank, thank you. Thank you. And thanks for being here. So let's hear it for the artist. Uh, thank you, everybody who came out. There's a lot of old friends here, a lot of people who supported my career, a lot of new friends, and a lot of people I don't know. Just thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it. And also, I hope you walk out of here informed and transformed because we gave you a lot of information and not so much that we want to change minds, so to speak. I want to enrich you as he does and as you do. And, and this is a nice bridge that Carrie Furness is and in the World Museum or the conduit for that, you know, for all of us to um, learn and experience and get um, better informed about you know, the art form, about the community, and, and, and how Rivers of Steel serves the community. Definitely, and thank you all for coming, and please come check out the artworks that they created at Cary once we open up again um, for the season in April of uh, 2023. You'll be able to come on a tour and see the sculptures, and look for this program again. As I mentioned earlier, it's now something we're gonna do iterations of yearly, the Industrial Grit and Graffiti program, and uh, we'll be out there Making some stuff and Chris, I, I, it'd be remiss not to thank Chop 'em Down Films for doing such an exceptional job at filming um, an industrial site unlike we've ever seen before. Absolutely. Uh, and and it'll be released online. Um, just check with Chris and yes. uh, Rivers of Steel. So thank you. Thank you all. Have a thank great you. day.